Hello everyone, my name is Jingyi. I am a senior X major and a human-centered design course thread. So the three courses I took to satisfy this were CS160, user interface design, which I then TA'd for for a year, um, CS294, critical making, and ME110, new product development. Instead of talking about really overall human-centered design principles, instead I'm going to show you a whirlwind tour of four projects I worked on, two of them in my classes, two of them in research, and talk about how I applied human-centered design principles in these projects. So, jumping right in. Um, while I have been exposed to human-centered design before through on-campus organizations such as Berkeley Innovation, which Leon mentioned, um, CS160 was the first design course that I formally took over the summer of 2015. In this class, the final project I developed was called GPS, which was an Android Wear application to help gender non-conforming folks and people in wheelchairs find nearby safe restrooms. Um, so just a quick demo of the app. From the phone side, you can set your preferences, such as like what gender and accessibility level of restrooms you want to see. You'll see them in a list and also in a filtered map like nearby your current location. However, we, the crux of this app was on the Android Wear side because we really wanted to focus on like instantaneous, oh, let me show you where restrooms are right now. So we had we divided it into three modes. The first one was active mode, which upon query, it would just bring you a list of all relevant restrooms. If you selected one, it would use Google Maps to route you to where that restroom was. The second one was passive mode, which was like, say you're traveling, you're like, oh, I could use the restroom right now, but I don't have to go and I don't want it to interrupt my workflow. So that's why we allowed users to set a radius and they would get a notification when a qualifying restroom appeared. Finally, logging, we had a crowdsourced database of restrooms and it would just take you some, through simple interfaces um, to put this restroom in the database, as well as voice commands to add in comments. We added this feature actually because through our user interviews and our formative studies, we learned that um, someone who was in a wheelchair mentioned a lot of her friends actually had accessibility issues res uh, res revolving around the mobility of their hands, so this whole process is actually entirely controllable by voice. Okay. Um, so, moving on, the next project I would like to show is called Azure, which was the final project for my critical making class. Um, and Azure was really, we wanted to, uh, our group and I wanted to explore like wearables, capitalism, and self-identity and the intersection of all of these. So Azure, as you can see, is this like wearable LED matrix display, which effectively turns your body into a billboard and thus a monetization platform. Mm -hmm. So the way Azure works is that um, someone who wants to make money will put on the Azure then companies can go to our website and make accounts and create their own advertisements and place bids for a specific user's ad shirt. Whatever, whoever has the highest bid will have their ad displayed on the user. In turn, the user makes the money from the company. Um, and we made a web interface with a lot of features to support this, which you can see on Bypass on .me, um, but specifically walking through some of these features that made it possible. Uh, we had company profiles, so you could sign in and make accounts. Uh, we also had an interactive bidding interface with a countdown. You could see when people preempted you, so you could always try to outbid them. We had local information, such as a uh, short bio of the person who was wearing the ad shirt, the number of people nearby, a map of their current location, and even a live camera feed of what their ad shirt was seeing, which also raises concerns about like speculations of privacy and Internet of Things and stuff. Um, we also created some fake user reviews for our user. Finally, the biggest technolo technological challenge of this project was to support the creation of ads. Um, so you could make text ads in whatever color and save them. You could even draw your own image ads. You could explore ads, etc. Um, and we also integrated with a texting API so the user of the ad shirt would get a text whenever they earned money. Um, we did this specifically because we wanted to inundate them with like, oh my gosh, look at how much money you're making through this project that you're wearing. But also because the inundation of all these text messages, we wanted to get them to think like, is this, is there something wrong here? I don't know. Um, so, while this project was technically challenging and we worked with many like integrations and frameworks such as like Meteor.js for the server backend and like a Raspberry Pi to actually drive and support the images of the Azure. Personally, it was my most rewarding class project um, because it was so relevant to the technology and the experiences I have as a Berkeley student, you know, like walking into Soda Hall, seeing everyone wearing like Airbnb or like Google shirts because they got them for free at a tech conference. Well, in reality, they just serve as free advertising for these companies. So if you think like getting some free tech shirts at a career fair is a good deal, we just wanted to see like, would you extend that even more towards like explicitly wearing ads on your body? 
Okay, so the la last latter half of my presentation will um, focus on research projects I've done in HCI, which is Human Computer Interaction, under Professor Bjorn Hartman, and how my classes and my experience in those have tied to them. So one thing I've learned from my classes are that CAD tools are pretty hard to use, especially for novices and non-mechanical engineering people in my classes, such as myself. Like, I often find myself struggling with 3D modeling programs, like weird transformations, perspectives, et cetera, and I'm like, listen, I just want to make this thing, I just want to 3D print this thing, but I don't want to struggle and use this complicated software to do so. Um, so this was largely the motivation of my first research project called Maker's Marks, mm -hmm. which would let you basically sculpt something from clay and put stickers on it, and you'll have a functional 3D printed object. So for example, let's say you wanted to make a working game controller from scratch, but fit perfectly into your hands. First you would like model the rough shape of it from clay, then you could put some stickers, like we have a library of them, on this object to correspond to like electronic or physical components. Um, we would 3D scan the object, our system would shell it out, re replace the geometry, and give you a fully functional 3D printed object without any of the 3D CAD modeling hassle. Um, to take this into an explicit usage scenario, another um, thing I learned from human-centered design, let's take the example persona user of my sister, and who's 13 and does not like very many things in life, but she does like her stuffed animal Dolphini. Sadly for Anne, so does her mean older sister, so Anne wants to make a box to keep Dolphini safe. So what she does is she finds some materials lying around her house to make box shape, she sculpts the letters mine just in case it wasn't clear whose box it belonged to. She puts some stickers on the top such as a speaker for an alarm, a gyroscope to detect if the box was opened, a hinge to, um, so she can actually open the box. She runs a 3D scan of this box, Maker's Marks finds the stickers, replaces them with the corresponding mounting geometry, and then because she can use electronic toolkits such as like little bits or like .NET gadgeteers to just snap in these components, hook it all up, and easily make a programmable box. Um, and the other three examples that resulted from Maker's Marks were in the title slide of my whole presentation. Okay, so in addition to using 3D printers as standalone fabrication machines, I've also explored them in a hybrid like machine artist performance setting for my other research project called BanksyBot. So here is one machine that came out of BanksyBot. It is a modified 3D printer, which we changed so it could decorate, or decorate existing objects, such as the heart padlock that you see mounted inside. So similar to Maker's Marks, BanksyBot also starts with a 3D scan. Um, after you get the model of your existing object, you can load it into an editing software and draw it in, uh, with the computer, so like you can directly use pen things, you can import SVG vector graphics and edit those, um, you can erase, undo, etc. And we also support all of this in near real time in a mode called live mode, which you will see soon, um, where the machine executes your drawings like about like one, like 30 seconds after you finish them. Um, so this allows for more like reflection and action with the piece, but also allows you to like undo things if you're like, oh no, like I actually don't want this. Um, so the emphasis on Banksy bot was on existing materials, right? So 3D printing is great, but it forces you to start from a like complete scratch. What if you wanted to decorate something you already made, like have a computer draw scale patterns on a fish because it's too like, tedious to do by hand, or you have an object that was personally important with sentimental histories, such as this piece of wood that looked like Michigan if you were from Michigan. Um, basically, we wanted to preserve the intrinsic or sentimental properties of objects, but still bring them into digital fabrication. So here is a uh, video of Banksy Bot in action, just drawing on that piece of wood. And my two research projects fall under the category of design tools for digital fabrication. And I would say probably the unifying thread in all my work is just a fascination with how people create content and also the cultures around that. Um, so I plan on continuing this into grad school where my hope, goal is to get a doctorate in human-computer interaction. Thank you for your time.